welcome to session on WebAssembly. First, raise of hands, who was in the session that was done by WASM just before this one? The one on server side WebAssembly. Nice, so because there's a bit of a disclaimer, I, I have demos, we looked at the same demos. Um, I'm gonna focus more on security aspects of the stuff that we're gonna talk about today um, because I think that it's, uh, that's one of the differentiators compared to other technology stacks. Um, but that's cool, okay, so um, let's see, let, let's allow people to walk in a bit. So using WebAssembly to run, extend, and secure the .NET application, and while people are still walking in, I can always continue with my introductionary slide because it's always nice to introduce yourself before you start talking. So I'm Neil Stanis and I work as a security researcher for Veracode. Uh, I have a background in .NET development. I started out with the first .NET bits in the early 2000s and I've always been working on security stuff as well. And in 2015 I was able to join Veracode where I'm right now part of the research team where I focus on static analysis of the .NET applications and I've done some pen testing, ethical hacking, which is quite fun, but it's much harder to build software that's secure, secure by default, that does all the stuff in the right way, um, so that's the thing. And I recently was awarded Microsoft MVP, which I'm really proud of as well, so um, that's it. That's all you're gonna hear about me and that's all you're gonna hear about Verico because you want to talk to me about that, come see me afterwards because today's topic is gonna be WebAssembly, and as I said, the talk before on server-side WebAssembly had similar introductions about WebAssembly being introduced in 2017 when it became something they called uh, version 1.0. It was released into four major browsers. Um, it became available and they called it MVP as well, like minimal viable product. They defined a roadmap to go forward. And from that perspective, um, it, wa it was there, it was usable. And it is a portable sized, low time, efficient binary format to serve com as a compilation target. That's the first paragraph you see over here. And that's exactly what happened with the first bits, right? Um, there was a tool introduced or a compiler cha tool chain called Enscripten, which you uh, could take a C code base, compile it into WebAssembly, and run it inside the browser. And this is, of course, AutoCAD. People are probably aware of it. They have a C code base and they compile it into WebAssembly. They're able to run their tools in the web, uh, which is pretty cool. I think Adobe probably had similar things that they did with some of their more advanced tools. But this was the first step, right? So taking a C code base, compiling it to WebAssembly, running it inside the browser. And quite performant as well, right? Because it's near native, it's quite minimal, it's, uh, it's all written for that purpose. What else did we see after this and after this happened? WebAssembly is also used as an SDK for SDKs. And what I mean by that is because it's a no compilation target, platforms like Disney Plus and Amazon Prime use it for their video streaming software. And they're able, even as Amazon states on the right article, that they're able to target more than 8,000 devices all at once by compiling their version for it, which is pretty significant, right? You can imagine like, you can run it on Android TV, which I do myself, but you might have got like a native setup box or you have like a, a different brand of television that has its own operating system inside. This allows them to easily deploy and also have quite performance on that system that it runs on, right? So that's pretty cool. That was the first things um, we saw with WebAssembly that when it took off and what people were doing with it. And right now we're at the stage where we're gonna talk a bit more about what WebAssembly, what we can do right now. Um, I'm first gonna do a brief introduction on WebAssembly and I'm gonna focus on what makes WebAssembly secure. Because I think by default, yeah, you can compile to it, but what are the internals? What's happening in there? What, what, does, uh, what does WebAssembly do? If you create a module, what makes it secure? Then we're gonna run .NET on WebAssembly, which you probably all can imagine what that will be. Second, we're gonna extend .NET with WebAssembly. So we're gonna uh, take a, a runtime of WebAssembly and put it inside our .NET application and use it to run stuff against, which is quite cool because it opens up a lot of possible ways to using it. And then we're gonna move more to a topic that's close to my heart, like how secure can it be? How secure can it become? And as I said before, and I see Elko in this room already, because he gave a session before, the demos you're gonna show, I'm gonna show, have some similarities, I have additional things added to it. And as I said, I'm gonna focus more on what makes WebAssembly secure and why, as a language, it's secure. The end conclusion, Q&A. So I have a GitHub repo that has all the demos that I'm showing today as well. And the slides are there, and at the end there's a link to it. You can get it there. So uh, don't like bother. And 
Um, there's already also a video of this one on YouTube if you search for the title. So, but now you're in the room, so now you're stuck with me for the next hour. WebAssembly design. When they started out, what was the goals that they had with creating this? It needs to be fast, efficient, and portable. And it needs to be near native speed across different platforms, right? That's what we saw before with Amazon and Disney+. Plus. That's exactly what they want. It needs to be readable and debuggable. So right now, it's a, it's a bytecode type of stack machine, how it runs. But there's also a textual representation. And if you, um, I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to touch the demo because of the time, but if you do WebAssembly, you can go open your development tools. You can exactly see what is the WebAssembly itself, what it executes, and how it interacts with the CLR, because there are some differences in that. We need to keep it secure. And um, of course, with a browser, same origin policy, we're good, right? No need to worry about anything. But if we take it outside the browser, we need to do more. And that's what we're going to see later on. And the last bit, of course, it's important, don't break the web. Uh, I think in the early days when we had browsers that were competing with each other and introducing some standards that might not have been as secure as they were supposed to be, um, it was always hard for browsers to get rid of a feature because that would break the way that it works. And uh, Mozilla would not like to lose users against Chrome and vice versa, right? So they just kept it there because of backwards compatibility. Because if you then look at it from security perspective, that's, that's a big hazard if there's stuff in that's broken by default, right? And that makes it a hard problem. So WebAssembly had a goal, though we don't want to break the web. And then looking into it in a bit more detail, as I said, it's a binary instruction format for a stack-based virtual machine, which is almost similar to .NET and MSIL and how it executes. There's a stack-based machine with operations that it goes through and that it will be uh, executing once it's done. It's designed as a portable compilation target. So it's C sharp, but you can write Rust, you can write Go, you can write Python. Uh, and, and, and compile it into, or in case of .NET, run it on top of WebAssembly, because that's, that's the key difference that we need to, that we're going to touch in a bit. And the security model of WebAssembly, it needs to protect users from buggy or malicious modules. Um, if we're developing nowadays software, and that's always like a metric that we have used ourselves in reports, almost 80% of what we do is third-party libraries that we pull in, which is a big risk, right? If there's a vulnerability in a third-party library that everybody uses, then we have a big problem to solve. Uh, one of the goals of WebAssembly was we need to make sure that users are more protected for doing that. And we also want to have useful primitives for developers to mitigations for developing safe applications. And what, what they mean by that is that by default, the API needs to be secure. And if you want to do something that's less secure, you're explicitly asked to do so. And if you look at the whole .NET and .NET Core ecosystem, I think they've really done a good job with .NET Core by doing that a lot more, by having APIs which are by default secure. And if you want to do something that's bad, the API is mostly self-explanatory, saying to you like, hey, are you sure? This might be a dangerous certification callback handle. I'm not sure what the name is, but you have it. When you want to suppress the certificate errors, you can do it. But the name of the delegate is quite explicitly saying, like, hey, be aware. This is, this is bad to do. So with WebAssembly, they had the same goals. They want to have a good set of primitives that everybody can use and work from. And then if we look into um, WebAssembly, as I said, the language itself, what makes it secure? WebAssembly deals with memory. And each module that you load inside a WebAssembly runtime will only have its own chunk of memory. So if there is another module loaded into memory that will also execute, of course, they need to find a way of interacting with each other. That's another problem, which we're going to touch later. But by default, it only has access to that contiguous immutable array of uninterpreted bytes. That was the definition that I found. The drawing you see on below is something that comes from a bytecode alliance. I'm going to touch bytecode alliance later as well. But Lynn Clark used to work for Firefox, Mozilla, right now she is with, I think, Fastly. And she has done a lot of good drawings on WebAssembly, how it works. And you're going to see a lot more of those blue drawings. And you can find the links. Um, also, they're the ones that I'm referring to. The, there's a notes version of the slide that has the links in it. So don't worry about that. You can find it. So it's isolated per, was, per module, and it's one array, right? So if you put hello in it, that's it. And the, if a module wants to access it, it will get it back from its own memory. But as I said, modules. In between, it's a bit different. If a module is hacked or has a problem, it can still access this memory because it belongs to that module. So there is still a possible way, if you look at it from a security perspective, to run into issues, right? What else is in place with WebAssembly to fix that is something called control flow integrity. And now we're going to get into technical detail. I was 
creating this slide last year, first time when I was like, hey, I need to explain control flow integrity, and if you look it up, it's a lot of academia, <laughs> and that's not, I'm not easy, like I'm just gonna, oh, this is, I need to have an easier example. So what control flow integrity means is that, let's say we have this piece of code, C-sharp code, that has a possible code path, right? This is quite simple. It, it takes a number, it writes it down to the console, then it has a condition when it says, like, hey, if number bigger, greater than five, we do the first compound, else we're gonna go to the second one, and then at the end, we're done. This is a control, this is a logical code path, and we have different options. If number is greater than five, we will have the first line, otherwise the second one. That's a possible path. So technically, we can draw this piece of code into the following map. We can say, hey, this is, a, this is a, a, the, first po uh, the first block will always execute. That's what everybody will get. Then we'll have that choice. If number is bigger, greater than five, we're gonna go left. Otherwise, we're gonna go right. And then we, end, we ended up at the same console right line. So this is almost like a map. I'm gonna write from A to B. Uh, and this map is done, uh, is created at compile time. And this is being stored inside your WebAssembly module, at least there is some heuristics. And at runtime, it will check for possible code paths. And if it diverts from this code path, this is quite simple code, but if there is some malicious stuff happening, it will run into a trap. And we're gonna see a trap in one of my demos as well. But it will stop the execution, right? So that's something that they call control flow integrity. Pretty powerful. So that, in combination with the module having only access to its own memory, makes it a quite secure model. And WebAssembly as a concept is pretty secure, and that's another project that I uh, ran into, which is pretty cool. Um, if you've seen a talk uh, that I did on .NET assemblies and sandboxing, this is the one that I'm using there, and there's a lot of overlap, but um, RLbox was created by, I think, a university in combination with Firefox. And what they've done is that if you run a browser and uh, you rely on a lot of plugins that render fonts, videos, all the content you need inside your browser, which of course, in the early days, um, it was if you had hacked a one of those plugins, you can run code inside the browser, you could take over somebody's computer, and so on, right? So it's a big hazard, and it's a lot of code that will be pulled in by that thing. So what they've done with RLbox, they showed that there is a way of taking a C-based plugin that runs inside your browser, compile it into WebAssembly, which gives it all the security stuff that I just talked about, right? So in C, C++, if you need to have your own buffers allocated, you need to copy memory, you can override bounds or exceed bounds, which is causing problems, right? That's like the, the, the early, the first security box. Um, with moving to WebAssembly, that's fixed to a degree that it relies on that memory and that control flow being as complete as possible, right? What they then did is that because they did not want to have WebAssembly modules inside of Firefox, they compiled those WebAssembly modules back into C code. And that's the code that they include in their code base. So they've taken WebAssembly as a language compile target and then moved it back to C in order to get all the security stuff for free and at least make it less susceptible to security issues, right? So that's pretty cool. And this is a, a, um, um, a project, and you, it's, it runs inside your browser right now. So if you use Firefox, and I think that's pretty cool, and that shows the power, like how good WebAssembly is conceptually, how the language works, and what makes it secure. So moving into running .NET on WebAssembly, um, I'm going to ask who runs Blazor and has it on top of, uh, let's say, runs Blazor for business purposes on a website or something else. Okay. Um, what do we need to do in order, this is a, uh, let me explain first, I need to explain. This is a .NET application, if you look at it conceptually, right? We have user code, IL code, which is C sharp code that somebody has written in order to execute. There is the standard library, the VCL, which has system.io, like all the stuff we need to build our application, the base class library. There is the execution engine or the VES, which in our case is the CLR, the .NET CLR that starts out. And there's the host, OS, um, where it runs on top of. This is what happens if you do a new console on your machine and it runs. We're gonna see that in a bit. If we want to run this on, if we want to run .NET on WebAssembly, we need to do this. We need to replace the execution engine or the VES with a WebAssembly implemented version. And then we can run it inside on a host browser. And that's exactly what of course happens with Blazor, right? So what happens is that um, the CLR itself is C code, the mono one, that was being compiled to WebAssembly, 
and then you just provide some plumbing code, some JavaScript bridges in order to interact with some system stuff you need from the browser, and you have the CLR itself, which is the .NET WASM, and you have your native IL .NET code that will then be executed inside the browser. And I'm not going to bother you with it, but if you do a .NET new project, Blazor, you look into it, if you open up the development tools, right now Edge even has like a web developer space that has WebAssembly in it, you will see that it will first download all the DLLs it needs, and then there is a WASM file at the end, which is the .NET CLR, which will bootstrap the process and which will start it out. And there was a bit touched as well in the last session about AOT, right? And this is, this is a hybrid version. This is still just having .NET assemblies running on a CLR that's in WebAssembly, allowing it to execute because of the lack of garbage collection, for sure. Will the garbage collector replace it that's been introduced in WebAssembly? That's one of the latest standards. I don't think that will be the case. I think it still will be a hybrid where performance stuff will be ahead of time compiled into a thing that will run more closer to the browser, which makes it faster. But there are some AOT stuff if you can do with Blazor, you will see it will explode in your face. Like the size will be quite big and it will compile for, no, I think like maybe half an hour or something in order to get something sensible out of it. Right, so that's the trade-off. If you look at it, I think um, uh, one of the PMs of ASP.NET also has a video on it, like would you want to do this? Yeah, if you want to do, let's say, video processing or you want to leverage the GPU inside your browser and you have a good component that runs on JavaScript or inside the browser, yeah, that will be a good AOT candidate. And then you can interact with it from Blazor, right, with a JavaScript bridge. That will be much more the way of doing it than just saying I want to fully compile .NET into an AOT that runs on WebAssembly. I don't think that's going to happen. But um, so as I said, this is the whole story on where we take a Blazor app and how that evolved, right? Because Steve Sanderson at some point said, like, hey, we can run, we can run uh, the C-based CLR for Mono in the browser by doing this. And then that's how it started out. I think it was like Andy C. Oslo a while ago where he showed it for the first time. And Steve Sanderson is responsible for a lot more, which we're going to see later on. Because the next step would be how can we take this outside the browser? How can we, in the schedule that we see over here, eliminate the browser? We need to have something that replaces it. And as uh, Elko already said in his previous version or his session, it's all tied to something called WebAssembly System Interface, or WASI, which was introduced by the Bytecode Alliance in 2019. The Bytecode Alliance is a cooperative group of companies together. Microsoft, Google is in it, I believe, Mozilla, Fastly, uh, a lot of it. Uh, Fermion is in it, all the new people. Um, so the bad guys behind Spin. And it should be a, a working group that focuses on taking WebAssembly outside the browser. And they want to show how it works by providing an implementation, which in their case is WASM time, as a runtime, right? In order to execute WebAssembly, we need to have a runtime. In order to run .NET, we need to have that vest, that CLR to execute. For WebAssembly, we need a runtime. It's a POSIX inspired, and it has taken a bit of a bit, bit of a different route, but it's a POSIX inspired, uh, engine independent, non web, system oriented API for WebAssembly, um, which makes it like all the stuff you need from a system in order to access things. And that's what its power is. And they also have one of the design things they say hey, this is a strong sandbox with capability based security. Right now, it only supports file system access. You can do, but you can limit it. Uh, the compute it uses as well. I'm going to show you that in a bit. And it will be having future support for sockets um, and other system resources, right? Because you want to maybe reach out to some service, and in order to have control over what it's allowed to access, we need to have some kind of a system interface that allows us to do that. And can everybody recall that standard? I think this is in some way similar to that standard because it has the goal of consolidating. That standard had the goal of consolidating the BCL for the different frameworks, ending up with .NET 6, where everything is into one silo, right? That's the thing. And uh, I think with WASI, they tried to achieve the same. There's, a, there's that unified layer, and we will see WASI a lot more. And if WASI would have existed in 2009 or 2008, this is the Solomon Hikes tweet that he gave, which I saw in the previous talk, I was like, oh, yes, this is the same one. Um, it would not have, there was no need to create Docker. But the next day after this, he did an additional tweet saying that, I'm not saying that Docker should not exist or replace. No, it should coexist. That's what he said. And that makes total sense. Because if we look at what happened at, I think it was KubeCon Cloud Native in October of last year, Docker released this, where they have a, 
container it was a shim on the right hand side. I'm hoping I'm not sure if you can see it, but the right side is a WASM module that runs on WASM Edge, which is a WASM runtime as WASI time is. It's the same. And it allows you to run it inside the same context, right? So it should coexist. And I think that's exactly where its power lies. You can have much more far smaller modules executing. Uh, and containers are still there because at some point you just need a full OS or a little bit more to do your things, right? Totally makes sense. So in order for us to be able to run WebAssembly outside the browser, we need to replace that host part with WASI and WASM time. And that's exactly uh, what happens. And then Steve Sanderson last build showed this. Uh, the guy that also did Blazor saying like, hey, we have a WASI SDK which can do exactly that. And it can take a console app and it can compile it into a WebAssembly uh, thing. Um, I'm going to show you some bits and pieces, which, as I said, if you were in the previous session, it might look familiar, but I'm going to do it anyway, because it, 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 um, it's part of the whole, whole thing. So I think I'm in it already. Yes. So what we see here is a normal console app, .NET new console. The only thing I added is the package that allows us to do the WASI SDK. Do I need to zoom it in a bit more? By help out, I can minimize this. Maybe one more. Make this one a bit smaller. So it's a preview one. It's, it's, it's working. Um, we're going to touch later on like what Microsoft is doing in this direction as well. Um, so what we see here is a. Um, is the following thing, and it has to do with um, a, just a simple console runtime where we're going to move into which type of architecture does this application run into or run on, on top of. If we then just do a .NET build, and if we then take the .NET DLL, because that's the, that's the thing, and say console WASI and run it, we will see it says nicely at the bottom, Welcome from ARM64, which is my M1 Mac, right? If I now say, because I added the .NET, um, the WASI SDK, if you build, um, there is another file being created, WASM. And right now, because there was already a build done, you don't see it happen. But what it takes, it, with Blazor, we have a WASI file, WASM file with all DLLs. But with this template, it will put all the DLLs inside that WASM file in, into a single bigger file, if you look into it. Um, we will see. We will see that it's 8.5 megs of data that has it all, right? So this is the binary that we created, which is the, uh, which is the other thing. And if we now say uh, .NET run, let me just quickly do that once more. .NET run. Right now, it says, "Hey, hello from Wasm." So the SDK itself has an internal thing. Once it does .NET run, it will take the Wasm time, embed it Wasm time runtime and executes this. So this runs on top of WebAssembly architecture. That makes a difference. And um, what can we do next? Let's say if we want to open a file. <laughs> I'm going to do it anyway. For file, let's say I want to read a file that's on my system. And I'm going to say system.io.file.open read all lines. And we're going to say I want to open my etc host file that's on my system. And then I'm going to say console write line, file, open up a file. How straightforward can it be? One on one. If we then say .NET build, we'll probably see a lot more happening right now with the output. It's doing the DLL. It's taking a bit more time. Am I still connected to? Yes. I should have got my own. I have my own 5G, so it should be fine. It doesn't show it. It has done it. So um, if I now do the bin debug, and this is the .NET one that runs on my machine, I should have done right all lines, but right now it returns a system string. Let me change that. That's not nice. I can also do read all text, right? That's the one. Let's do that. And now say .NET build, just to be sure and do exactly the same. We will see it writes down my contents of my slash etc host file. If I do this with the WebAssembly one, I can also do wasm time and say bin debug and then wasm. 
you will see it runs into a problem. It will say, hey, uh, let me maximize this a bit. There's a lot of stuff happening. But it wants to open a file that it hasn't got access to, right? This is the whole capability-based system. Right now, it's only file-based, so it, allow, it won't allow you to access it. If I then say, was some time, and I give it access to the file, directly what it is, and then I say, bin debug, I should give it etc, not the host file, of course. It's only a directory that I want to give it access to. Not sure why I'm doing that. Then you will see the same happens, right? This is the WASM time, and because I instructed the, uh, the runtime itself to have access to that file, by default it doesn't have it, and you need to explicitly do that, right? So this is cool. This is, this is working. This is not any fancy demo, but it gives us more granular control over what's happening. So let's move a bit back to the slides. It's experimental, and what I say about that is that they um, introduced this, and um, the question is, will this land in .NET land, or will this be available? Um, I, I saw Rich Lander at some t thread saying, like, yeah, it's not a matter of uh, yes or no, it's a matter of when, and, and that's a good sign, I guess, because there's a lot of goodness if you can do WASI. There is, a, uh, there is an issue on GitHub you can track, you can see, um, and um, I was hoping that some preview had, a, had some bits and pieces inside of it, but the last preview published this week didn't have it yet, so that's unfortunate, but they're working on it. So I'm, 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 I'm hoping that it will be part of .NET 8. So allowing us to do a lot more, and we're gonna touch Wazi and the power of in a bit more, because the next thing that we can also do is we can say, hey, I want to extend my .NET application with WebAssembly. And the funny fact is that WASM time itself also has a NuGet package that allows you to run the WASM runtime inside your .NET application. Um, and you can, you can extend uh, your application with it. And it's, it's, it's module-based. It's almost like composite applications, which we've done in the past. So you can take a Rust-based program and run it inside your .NET application and, and allow it to interact. And, it's, and that, that's pretty cool. So that's the next demo I'm gonna do, which is more advanced. And we're gonna first dig into a bit of Rust code in order to understand what the module does, which, hey, example, does something with files because we need to interact with it, but we're gonna configure a lot more in order to do our stuff. So let me show you first the Rust module. Crash course in Rust, if you're ready. <laughs> That's not gonna happen, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Although I would, if you're interested in learning a new language, I would encourage you to look into Rust because it's, it's gonna, my guess is it's gonna be big, really big. Um, and there's also a lot of uh, like similar things. This is, um, this is Rust code. At the bottom we see a, f a main function, recognized, right? It has the ability to read args from the system. It will then take some of the args and it will pass it on to the process function underneath that on the top. And then if we go up the process function itself, it has some way of dealing with errors and it's all chaining of methods that they do within Rust, which is, I think, pretty powerful pattern. But it will allow you to open a file, copy its content to the second location that you pass on to this module. And it all does it based on the arguments given to the module. That's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the note I'm gonna take. If we take this module, we can do a cargo build. And I think it's not gonna do anything because the output is already there, but it will compile and it will create a WASM file, which is in target, I believe. WASM target, it's not there yet. Let's, let's move to the console app that we're gonna run it in, because right there we see the following code. Let me minimize the, this one, let me show you what's inside. So the only package I'm referencing here is WASM time 3.0, which is stable, you can use it. It allows us to run WebAssembly, and I have a, a WASM directory which has a compiled version of the thing we saw before, the Rust thing, and there's a copy script. If you want to run it locally on your system, you can run this one, and it will take it from the debug, and it will copy it to this thing. Um, and now we're gonna look into a lot of code. And because it's a preview, and the way that WASM time and WASM time package itself runs and how you interact with it, it has some open ends, which I'm gonna touch in a bit, it's more like what the stuff that Bytecode Alliance is working on right now to fix. But we need to do the following things, and I'm just gonna talk you through. Um, 
We need to create a engine that allows us to run Wasm, right? We need to have a linker that allows us to type uh, type system and link stuff together. And we're going to also make sure that we use Wasi in order to do that. We're going to set some configuration. Then we're going to load our module, which in this case is that Wasm module I just compiled with Rust. And we're going to load it from file. We're going to instantiate. Then we're going to get the main function to execute in order to do that. And there's one other trick that I'm doing. As I said before, I'm passing on the arguments. And right now, what I'm doing is I'm passing on the arguments of this console app 101 to the WebAssembly module in order to give it its inputs. Because otherwise, we need to just like do a bit more. And that's, that's a glitch. But I'm going to explain to you why that needs to be done. So with this, we can build. Let's move to the other folder before I continue. That's the extend console app. I say dot net build. Still succeeds. Haven't changed anything. Demo gods are good. So, so what it does right now, it takes the arguments and it, it wants to copy your file. So if I do a dot net run, I can say I want to copy once again my etc host file, which by default I should not have access to, and I want to copy it to a file called hosts in this folder, where it executes. If I do that, then nothing happens, or at least you don't see anything happening, because I've tied up the output of the runtime to write to log files. And you can also do a, um, a redirect of it, but this is nicer so I can show it to you. So what we see over here is that, hey, I want to open error hosts, but it's not part of our pre-opened list that we're allowed to use. Right, so this is almost the same as we saw with the WebAssembly runtime, but right now we have this one um, uh, um, saying it to us. So what we can do is we need to confide a config, as we have done with the console call that we've done before, saying, hey, with pre-opened, and I'm going to say, um, A to say, I want to open a folder, and I want to have it mapped on ETC. You can even do some mapping. There you see the analogy with containers and virtualized systems and stuff. This is almost a similar model. And I need to give it access explicitly to its current folder, because by default, it doesn't have that. So let's do that as well, not to bother you too much with that. So let's say the dot folder needs to map on the dot folder currently. That's fine. So right now, once more, let's say dot net build, just to be sure that I haven't mistyped anything. That's good. If I now say copy it, we should have the file up here, right? And that's here. That's, this is the same file that I'm not like faking you. This is the file that I copied from my system and because I gave it explicit access. So this allows us to run WebAssembly inside our .NET application as a composite and then have a module. Let's say you have something that written that's proprietary or that's high performant, something else, and it is being compiled into WebAssembly. You can just easily embed it. And yes, it involves a lot of code. As I said, we're going to touch that in a bit. But this is working. This is technology that's there and that's, that's, that's usable. So that's pretty cool. And there is a lot more that we can limit right now, and it's the following thing I'm going to say, because you already see something called fuel consumption over here. And if a WebAssembly engine executes, it consumes fuel. And that's just a conceptual thing. It doesn't mean like, hey, operations-wise. I think it's some way tied to a WebAssembly web instruction being executed. But you can define fuel. So what you can do is you can say, hey, I expect this module not to consume up more fuel than this which let's say in the future some module gets hacked and somebody puts in malicious code that tries to steal your cryptocurrency wallets that are on your system, then it will probably consume a lot more fuel and it will try to do a lot more. And by doing this, you can limit what it's allowed to do. So let me quickly turn it on. So it's just a matter of, hey, I want to do with fuel consumption turned on. You need to explicitly add fuel. And let's add a lot in order to make sure that we're in the right bounds. And that's the wrong button. Let's say 50,000. And then at the bottom, I already had a um, console write line that, hold on, that we're going to use in order to get the amount of fuel that has been consumed. So let's say .NET build, just to make sure I haven't, fat fingers haven't mistyped anything. And let's then do the .NET run. Let's just make sure we remove the host file and then do the .NET run again. So what we see at the bottom here, I'm hoping everybody can see it a bit, but it says consume fuel, 35,000, which is the 35,000 ticks that it has taken in order to execute this one. So what if I say, hey, you're only allowed to limit five, to limit that to 5,000, as I said, not 50,000, but 5,000. 
Done a build. Let's make sure we have the host file removed and let's do it again. We will see, as I mentioned before, it runs into a trap. This is one of those traps. And depending on the instruction set, it might still copy the file because it gets interrupted, right? So there must be some compensating action or something else happening. But this allows us to control the amount of compute the module can use, which makes it less malicious for anybody, right? Do you remember one of those design principles, WebAssembly, making sure that it's like uh, securing the users and, and in a better way. And this is exactly one of those features, right? So wrapping up. <clears throat> this is pretty cool. So it allows us to run .NET. We have .NET. We can extend it. We can take WASI. And what's another thing that makes WASI quite powerful is something called trusted computing. And this is a, um, um, a diagram or a drawing that probably everybody uh, knows. Um, X, XK, uh, KCD. There's a Bobby drop table, SQL injection one. There's one about software supply chains that I always use about components and blicks uh, on top of each other. But if we you run something on Azure or AWS, these are the layers that we're like at risk of because there is a layer of a uh, customer might be compromised. There might be an employee that was inside the organization that have compromised that layer. And we go down, we see, hey, well, there's the layer that involves the hackers. And then we get into the hardware level that might be governmental stuff that's influencing that. This is, of course, like, I would tell you speaking, but this is the trusted computing uh, modern tech stack that we use. And some people um, from Red Hat started a project called Enarx. And they're also part of the Bytecode Alliance. Uh, it's, it's a company behind it. It's not the, the project itself, it's called Enarx. But it allows you to run uh, applications in T's, trusted execution environments, and it's WASI based. So what it takes, it, this is a thing that I stole from their documentation, but it has a trap model where it says, like, I don't trust all these middle layers. I don't trust the host. I don't trust the host own, owner who uh, runs it. So Azure, AWS, the people behind it, they probably do a terrific job in making sure that we're secure. But if you're really paranoid, you need to maybe look into your risk model and say, like, that's different. What it also does is, because NRX itself and the T's are pieces of your processor that's part of the hardware, they can verify that, that, it's became from that, that it was produced by that manufacturer because of some signing keys that are inside. And Anarx itself is a WASI, WASM time-based runtime, um, and it has some heuristic. Once it starts out, it will have some timing internally, knowing like, hey, if this runs and it needs to execute within this time, I'm pretty confident that this is the right Anarx runtime that I'm using, right? To also mark off the runtime being compromised. And the runtime itself is publicly available for everybody, open source. Everybody can see how it's written, what's inside, which makes it for everybody to verify, right? That's part of the deal. You cannot rely on it. Everybody just does it, but we can verify, and that's pretty cool, right? Anarx itself then takes some of those uh, process, processor specific things. So it's not a TPM, it's the T, and it had a specific from versions from Intel and IBM. Right? But it takes NRX, it runs it, and it takes WASI and runs it on almost against the, the CPU without all the layers in between. And you could just take that console app I just compiled into uh, WASI with WASM uh, and, and put it on there and just run it. Can you imagine if you process data that might be confidential or if there's data that's, yeah, that, that, that should not be disclosed, this is a way of, of limiting that risk by running it inside the cloud, but having more control over what layers are inside of it. And this is one of the outcomes of having WASI and having the ability of taking WebAssembly outside the browser. As I said before, um, there's a lot of code in my demos, like, oh, you need to glue stuff together. It's like, oh, it's a hobbyism. That's how it feels. And yes, but um, there's a lot of good stuff happening with the Bytecode Alliance. And I'm going to move on to some future stuff and talk you through like what will be the next thing available. And some of it is already there as well. So what's next? As I said before, another nice drawing from Link Clark, composition of an average code base will have 80% of other people's code or modules. And I'm lazy, I'm a developer, I want to use this money stuff that's already there. I'm not going to rewrite it myself. That's stupid, right? You'll probably run into the same issues. So if we run a .NET application and if we have a tree of dependencies, right? This is a module, a tree of modules, and one is part of the, the first one that starts it all up. And if there are dependencies underneath, a .NET application and all the DLLs will have the same access as the process it runs in. So if it has system access to file system or to a socket or 
Um, it, it, it can do stuff, so all the dependencies will have it by default. It will just pass on the keys, as this module will show, right? This is the WebAssembly module 3 as well. It will just say, like, hey, you have the same access that I have. You can just continue on doing. What, what happens if one of those malicious or modules becomes malicious? And it has, like, a nice evil thing on his face. Um, I want to peek into the file system, and because he has access to that file system, he can do it, right? That's the, that's the conceptual thing behind it. Or... This is a malicious module, but what there is a vulnerability in a module, then maybe an attacker can control it from the outside. I say, like, hey, I want to have, um, give me more information about the system. Sure, stranger, I'll just tell me what to do, right? So this is another way. How could you mitigate this risk? You can maybe introduce something called process isolation. And if people have seen my .NET talk on sandboxing assemblies, this is almost a similar world, where you take a, uh, a process, an additional process, and if there is different access rights, then um, you can do two things. Uh, you can split it up and say, like, hey, this one runs here, this one runs there. But if it then needs to communicate, there needs to be some IPC or some pipe um, used, right? Process isolation inside your browser relies on this type of construct, where it's like a, each tab or each website will have its own process depending on the type of browser, but there's an IPC call happening underneath if it needs to, stuff needs to be exchanged. And this is what you need. There's a lot of overhead. Because if we just have two modules, and this is not drawn to scale, that's the thing I like about this drawing, this, she, she's drawing it in, it would be nicer if we have a process uh, type of approach that we could move to something called a nano process. And that's exactly what Bytecode Alliance is working on right now. It is called WebAssembly Nano Process or Component Model. And what they do is that they allow you to do sandboxing as we have seen before. So, there's, a, there's somebody in charge that will give modules the access that it needs and nothing more, nothing less. There's one that, have the, the, that will de decide everything, right? So you can do this, you can access it, that's fine. That's the first step. Second step is that each module will still have its own piece of memory, right? That's the, one of the guarantees that we saw at the beginning when we talked about WebAssembly and how, it, how, it's been, how it's designed. So if it wants to interact with data that belongs to another memory, somebody needs to help out with that. And that's, of course, that piece of... That's the police officer or the safety guard that can be in charge of that. And that allows you to uh, change types. But there is more to this, right? You saw me in my demos doing stuff with command line arguments. That's not the way. We want to have a type system that allows us to define how modules look and how they can communicate with the outside world and how they can exchange types and, and use them, right? So there is a need for interface types as well. And we still want to have that whole granular... Um, um, Access control, right? Um, limiting access. I think this is pretty powerful. People who have done .NET probably know code access security. It almost has a similar approach. It was only a bit too early, and it, it, there was not enough adoption for it. And it also was fundamentally broken, aside from that. But there is a really need for doing this, right? And not rely on a process. So if we have a nano process, we want to have some module that's in charge that will delegate access to the modules below. Say, so like, hey, you can only do this you can only do this amount of compute, as I showed before. You can access these files on this folder, or I want you to write your files into this location. There's a lot more control on top of the module. And I think that's pretty powerful. And that's all being captured in something called component model. With five minutes left, I'm just going to make sure that we squeeze this one in. So Cloud Native Wasm Day. We have KubeCon at the end of April in Amsterdam. There's also a cloud native Wasm day done, and uh, some of these people are going to be there as well talking about this. The videos are normally up like a couple of days after, pretty instantly. That's cool. But if you're attending and if you can go to that cloud Wasm day, I would encourage you if you're interested in this. So this is uh, Luke. Luke Wagner, who is, was working for Mozilla, now works for Fastly, and he is like part of the guy behind the component model and WASI. And what they do is they want to have tooling available. You can probably imagine like, we need to have some kind of IDL, so something that describes a component, how it looks, what the types are, what it needs. And we need to have tooling around it. So for Rust, for Go, for Python, the component model has already got some tooling. So you can take that WebAssembly module I just took with Rust and then have it being described. And you can then, let's say if you run it on Java, create a Java file that allows you to use it right away. So that's all done, right? It's almost like at service reference or that kind of thing, right? It's quite similar, but it will still give us the granular control underneath the hood, but it's a lot more friendly than the code I was typing before. So that's pretty cool. And as I said, if you look at this all, um, I would encourage you to look into the cloud, uh, that Cloud Wasm Day uh, that's also done here, a cloud native, it's Europe version done in Amsterdam. And we have seen this before. 
this is, as I said, Code Access Security, that's the book on the right. That's the one I bought when I started out developing, which is like this thick. It talks about Code Access Security, which turned out to be a user space mutex. You can just flip and it's turned off. And the left-hand side is the DCOM. It's not about distributed COM. That's also what Luke says. It's not, we're not talking about distribution of loads. It's more about interacting and securing components. So, but there's a lot of uh, similarities. And all of this, and I want to emphasize this, if I look at it from my security uh, like hat, I put my hacker hat on and say like, hey, what's the biggest problem? It's WebAssembly as a whole. It still remains how secure is the runtime and how secure is the virtual machine that you're using. So at Black Hat DEF CON in August last year, there was a lot of talk on WebAssembly and it was all focusing on fuzzing runtimes and showing like, hey, this was wrongly implemented, so that's why I can execute more stuff. Yeah, okay, it's good that people do it, but fundamentally, um, that should be done a lot more. That's like, I'm taking this brick and I'm throwing it through the window and I can get inside right now. Yeah, that's totally true, but how can we do a better job? The good thing is that Bytecode Alliance gives an example on how they deal with WASM and security, and they have a real good blog post on how they guarantee that WASM time has got security correctness, it's all written in Rust, and Rust has got a lot of language uh, security features, similarly to WebAssembly, like control flow integrity, the whole borrowership and ownership model. It's pretty powerful, that's why they used it. They use a lot of fuzzing and formal verification, and they have a real security process in place. Like once something happens, they will act on it and they will fix it, and it's visible for everybody, right? So from that perspective, this all is pretty cool. I, th I totally get the whole technology shift and that it's secure by default if you use it in the right way, but still there is a big part that we need to rely on, that's the WASM runtime. So WASM Edge, WASM Time, there's a lot more. WASMer, uh, even Spin has his own like thing that it does. I think it has WASM Time inside, but it still relies on how that's implemented. That's something to keep in the back of your mind. Because in general, if I, if I can conclude, Cloud Native love, loves WebAssembly, it's here to stay. Um, I think it has a lot of potential, even if, if the tooling is in place, you can do composite apps, uh, my demos, I have one demo I have not shown because of the time, but I have also a demo where I take .NET, WebAssembly, and run .NET inside of it, on top of it, which, like, why would you do it? I don't know, because it's fun, but it shows that it works. You can also see the amount of compute it takes. It's like, I think, m uh, multiplies by 100, <laughs> but it works. You can do it. That's a demo. You can find it in, in the GitHub as well. Um, and I like the whole top-down approach that the Bytecode Alliance has taken because they've shown us this is a way that we envision how component models can look and how the tooling should look. And right now, they allow everybody to, as in like me, talk about this and show it to you and get feedback in order to move forward. And I think um, they're doing a pretty good job. And I'm really looking forward. I'm really going to publish next, uh, next cloud wasn't there, as I said before. So with two minutes left, let me wrap up. So the Future Tech repository at the top is the one that has all the demos and the slides. You can reach me on Veracode email. Um, I'm on Mastodon, and I have a blog, and I'm going to say thank you for your time, for your attention. Hopefully, uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. And if there are any questions, now is the moment. <laughs>